Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Silver. I'm the CEO here at National Council Victoria, and we appreciate you joining us. Before we begin, National Council of Victoria would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands for which we all stand upon today and pay respects to their ancestors, elders, past, present, and emerging. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, the second part of gender equality, tips, hurdles, and successes, our deep dive. As I mentioned, this is the second gender equality webinar. The first one was held this past August, 2020. The purpose of this webinar is to support Jewish organizations to succeed in achieving their gender equality aspirations and goals by providing an ongoing, regular, and informative and interactive forum, a gender equality community of practice in which leaders and change makers can learn from each other's experiences, lessons, hurdles, and successes in gender equality. And let me make a note that National Council uh, Victoria is actually partnering with Monash University, the ADJC uh, organization part. And if you could please take a moment to fill out the survey for us, that would be greatly appreciated. You can find that on our social media as well as there and our website. Today, let me welcome Leanne Chapman, Group Manager for Uniting, and Rabbi Daniel Rabin, Rabbi of South Caulfield Hebrew Connect Congregation, excuse me. Really appreciate both of you being here with us today. Leanne Chapman will discuss the challenges with getting everyone on board with gender equality and the importance of this work in an organization and having champions. She will explore unconscious bias, how it results in outcomes that do not represent gender equality and will share examples and strategies to address in your organization. Leanne has strategic leadership experience having held a range of senior management positions in child and family welfare and a background in health and child protection. Leanne has a depth of experience achieving cultural change at Uniting. She'll discuss bringing staff and stakeholders from all levels of a multi-site organization along on the workplace equality and respect process. During the implementation, Connections Uniting Care had 400 staff across 11 sites. It has since merged and is now known as Uniting. Uniting is a nonprofit organization offering a range of services to the community, including aged care, drug and alcohol services, child youth and family services. Please join me in welcoming Leanne. Thank you, Alex, for that um, lovely introduction. And I too would like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional land, the owners of the traditional land and pay my respects to those past, present and emerging. Um, and I really um, appreciate being invited here today to talk about um, the challenges that, that um, and, the, the, and the achievements that I feel um, I've been able to work towards in trying to um, look at gender equality um, across our organisation. So as, as Alex mentioned, um, I did work for Connections, which is now merged into Uniting, and Connections at the time had 400 staff. And um, it, it, just as Uniting is a, is a social justice, um, is, is core to our organisation. And um, yeah, if I can just move on to the slides actually would be really, helpful. Thank you. Um, so just um, as, as I mentioned, um, social justice is, core, is a core organisational value of uniting as it was with connections. Um, gender inequality is an issue of social justice. So um, it's incumbent on us to kind of work at that every level as we can to try and address social justice. Um, there is an inextricable link between gender inequality and family violence, and this has been highlighted in more recent years. So um, it's a really strong agenda for us um, organisationally um, to try and um, change, try and shift the culture if we can, because the workplace, um, if I could just move to the next slide. Um, thank you. Um, we'll keep going to the next one. Sorry, I probably should have just um, said next slide before. So, 
So the workplace is a key platform that can be influenced and has the potential to impact more broadly in the home and in social settings. So what we do in our work is often influenced and vice versa in home and social settings. So um, I, it was a great privilege to be able to lead this work at the former Agency Connections and what is now uniting and an opportunity to try to create cultural change that has a wider impact. I can move to the next slide. So I, in, in start commencing this work, I actually um, submitted an, an expression of interest to an organisation called Our Watch, which hopefully many of you will have heard of. Um, and that was around supporting, supporting the implementation of standards that would embed practices and processes within our organisations, within our organisation that support workplace equality and respect. So this was back in 2016, and, and whilst it's been a long journey um, in terms of looking at gender equality in all roles that I've worked with, I think this actually really gave us some really clear um, set standards to, to work towards. So as I mentioned, our watch it is a, it's a national leader in the prevention of violence against women and their children in Australia. Uniting has over 300, 350 sorry, 3,500 staff and Connections had just 400. And so the staff group was much smaller, but it provided a platform form to work with in order to address some of the underlying values and assumptions in relation to gender equality. And this is really important because we all come from, if I can move on to the next slide. Um, if we, we all come from, Sorry, thank you. Um, from varying backgrounds, and um, it's it's an opportunity to really try and bring everybody together. So, we require the support of our most senior leaders within the organisation in terms of where we needed to start. We we needed to review um, every practice, policy, and process that we had through a gendered lens. So when we talk about applying a gendered lens, it's about having an understanding that women and men have been conditioned to see things in a certain way. When making a decision in relation to a policy, process or practice, we need to look at the implications for our work in terms of gender and what those implications will be. Every decision will have a consequence and we need to be open to reviewing and making changes to practice and policy that demonstrate a commitment to doing so. Staff need to see this model through a real commitment to change. We, we recruited champions also at every level of the organisation to be able to challenge some of the dominant thinking. I can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So the important elements I would say in terms of our work and continues to be an important, very important is the Our Watch website. They've got some fantastic resources on there. And um, where we actually started was, was um, inviting all staff at every level and position within the organisation. And this included all our admin staff, our caseworkers, team leaders, managers, senior managers, finance, people and culture was a really important one to attend a session on what was called Change the Story. So it's a video that is on, on the Our Watch website. And we held several sessions across all the various sites, so there were nine different sites to ensure staff had as much opportunity to attend a session as possible. For those, pe for those people who have not seen this video, it's a great resource that really identifies gender inequality in, and that inextricable link that I spoke about to family violence. Change the Story, the video, is also a great conversation starter. We had practitioners who, who attended, who applied gendered lens within their practice. But it was great to have them in the room with the discussion that then followed after the video. They became our champions. So these conversations were really important. And, and as I said, everybody's at a different place with their understanding in terms of what gender equality means. We then, then developed working groups at, at a, both a leadership level and, and staff level across nine sites to get these conversations have, happening and, and looking at how do we actually... Um, you know, look at all our practices and processes and what does this mean for our um, a whole range of um, areas that we needed to focus on, even, you know, the impact on our operations, impact on our employment. So some of the, I'll just move on to the next slide, thank you. Some of the, the challenges we had, um, 
as I said, a core part of the work was to review the five workplace quality and respect standards against our policies, practice and processes. So the areas that we focused on um, are clearly in the um, equality and respect, workplace equality and respect standards that sit on the Our Watch website. And they're quite comprehensive. So they go through in great detail um, all the areas that we needed to be looking at organisationally. So that was around our commitment to gender and quality, equality, which is really key to making any change. The conditions that exist, um, the culture that's, that's currently present, the support that we can wrap around um, these, these changes and what, what is core business. So I really encourage um, you to have a look at this, these standards because, as I said, they're very comprehensive and quite detailed and it really um, sets you up to question because you can be thinking, and I must say that I really thought we were, we were on track, but there were a number of areas we really needed to work on to enhance and improve. This took time and commitment at a senior level and, and also, you know, engaging the other staff and more broadly to, to get them involved with it as well. It also took a willingness um, by our organisation to consider amending policies and practice that was that may not have been aligned to these standards. And this is why a commitment to gender equality is required at every level of the organisation to achieve real change. If I can move on to the next slide. So gender equality, um, you know, as we all know, it can, people can see it as not their business. Um, it challenges discrimination, it disrupts, it disrupts the status quo, it questions men's right to power, men can feel blamed, and it creates some challenging conversations that need to occur. So even into 2020, gender equality can create discomfort. We need to name gender bias, shift cultures and change attitudes. This is something that I feel really passionate about and it is a challenge that I continue to experience as a leader. It's not new and it is an issue that continues to prevail in a range of ways in 2020. I have made a commitment myself to ensure that I choose to reflect and acknowledge my own unconscious bias and promote discussions and supervision with staff and others in team meetings. I try to apply a critical lens when making decisions to look at what the impact is going to be for the person and will that result in an outcome that discriminates against them because of their gender? And this all might sound very um, simplistic, but it's, it is a very complex issue. Um, and I think I'll talk about an example in a moment um, that relates to returning to work after parental leave and some of the challenges of, that I've experienced around those sorts of arrangements at, in, in various, at various times within organisations. So moving on to the next slide, um, in terms of organisational challenges, there's certainly budget and operational impacts, um, and as I just mentioned, paid parental leave for one. Flexible working arrangements that may not suit the business requirements, for example, shared roles, reduced hours, working from home. Structures that need to be put in place to respond to issues as they arise. As a leader, I find I need to continue to challenge this issue, particularly in flexible working arrangements and in relation to to people returning from parental leave and the constant reactions I get even in 2020 about roles being part-time rather than full-time at a leadership level. Interestingly, these reactions often come from staff on the ground um, and PNC and other layers within the organisation. There's a dominant construction in our thinking that leadership roles require people to be full-time and on site. This would effectively rule out people returning to their previous roles and this is really um, gender inequality at its worst. We need to be proactively problem solving to make flexible arrangements work to ensure that we're creating gender equality in our workplace at all levels. Flexible work arrangements may be clearly documented in policy, but it is what their reality is and how easy or hard it is for staff to have their requests supported. There needs to be a safe culture built where staff are encouraged to take up flexible leave options and this should be promoted. Sometimes it's the subtleties that prevent staff from making requests. It can be, there can be all the appropriate policies in place that's actually what they look like um, on the ground. So if I can just move on to the next slide in terms of what has helped. So probably having lots and lots of individual conversations that are very educational, supportive and non-blaming because, as I said, we all come from a different place. Um, in terms of our upbringing, our, um, 
the way in which, you know, we perceive gender, supporting staff to understand their own unconscious bias. And this is a really critical aspect um, of, of being trying to, to really promote gender equality. People need to understand what their unconscious biases are. Attitudes towards gender equality have been learned from a very early age and then reinforced through stereotyping. It can be really hard to shape these underlying attitudes. Each and every organisation will be different as it may depend on the ratio of staff numbers and gender. In, in all our uniting staff coming in, actually do a short course on, on, on unconscious bias as part of their induction. And I think this really helps to get people thinking about what these unconscious biases are in respect to gender and other biases they may have. We need to acknowledge and recognise that we all have them and this is really important because like watching change the story, we need to get people onto the same page. In terms of um, further suggestions, um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, I think providing safe places to have um, reflective conversations as a group as well is really great, and, you know, respecting people's different places as to where they're at. Because um, it can, these conversations can be really um, engaging and really challenging for people, but it can also be helpful in terms of shifting thinking. So having we we were having a quality topic on gender equality that highlighted important considerations such as the use of non-gendered language and open discussion on the pros and cons of this, and being able to support these group discussions in a non-blaming and ongoing way, so people feeling really safe to speak out. This, this is a cultural shift and it can take time and it requires a commitment at a leadership level and at every layer of the organisation and we need to lead by example and make changes that demonstrate a commitment to gender equality. And my final tip is um, probably just to be really, uh, really realistic in knowing that any cultural change takes time and we all need to work at it. That concludes um, my presentation and I look forward to some questions coming through. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Leanne, really appreciate that. And yes, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of the rabbi's presentation. So I hope our guests will start to use the chat function and put through any questions that they may have. And if they want to direct it to either Leanne or the rabbi, that would be okay as well. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Rabin. He will address getting participation of women in leadership roles in Orthodox synagogues. He will discuss examples of challenges faced in the process so others can learn from his approach and experience to better lead and implement gender equality in their own organizations. Rabbi Rabin is an experienced rabbi having served in various rabbinic roles for over 15 years, skilled in nonprofit organizations, coaching, family therapy, couples therapy, public speaking, and management. He is passionate about mental health and self care and holds a master degree focused in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy from Ken Miller Institute School of Psychology Counseling. Rabbi Rabin believes each of us has a role to play and will discuss his approach and strategies to address gender equality. Rabbi, it's a pleasure and an honor for you to be here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much for um, inviting me to talk um, with you all this afternoon and um, to the National Council for your incredible work that you are doing in the space. And um, as Leanne said, and thank you, Leanne, for your presentation, it was very enlightening to see how it's, you know, occurred in, in the context that you were talking. But certainly, um, I, I liked what you ended off by saying that, you know, this is a, certainly a continued work in progress. I don't think anyone has reached the end game, unfortunately. And so we've all got our, our bits to do. And I think as leaders, and we're all leaders in some way, and some of us more formally are, you know, in charge of certain congregations, organizations. Uh, but if you do happen to be in a position of leadership, I think it's so crucial that from the top down, the messaging, the speaking, the talking, uh, the attitude um, begins and really sets the, the agenda and the, and the example for all of those um, that are under your leadership. So thank you very much, Leanne. And again, thank you to the National Council for inviting me. So 
we, we don't have a lot of time and that's probably a good, good thing because you give a rabbi a microphone and we could go on forever. But um, when I say we, we don't have a lot of time, I mean, there's, we, could, we could address so many aspects of you know, gender equality within congregations. And I, um, I had the privilege yesterday of meeting with the uh, National Council organizers for today's event. We just had sort of a, a discussion about what we were talking about and it, we really got carried away um, and it made us realize how much we could certainly uh, talk about in this topic. But one thing that I did start off yesterday explaining to the organizers, and I think it's important uh, to address it at the onset right now, and that is when we think about gender equality in, in synagogues or in religious organizations, um, I'm sure we all know, and I, I don't know where all of you come from, but if you live in Melbourne, for example, you know that there's such a variety of congregations. There's Orthodox, there's liberal, there's conservatives. Within Orthodoxy, there's so many different denominations. So each congregation will have its own sort of set of religious values, its own sort of understanding of a halakha, of Jewish law. And so my purpose today is not to tell you which way is the correct way in terms of uh, approaching halakha in this topic. But I would like to say that whatever your approach is, I think it needs to be genuine. I think it needs to be with empathy and with respect to others. And in, in, in regards to how we incorporate that in this topic, I think regardless of which way you might be inclined in terms of your religious observance, I don't think there's an excuse to use that as a, as a mechanism or a means to try and uh, you know, discriminate against anybody for whether it's their gender, whether it's their orientation. And halakha, Jewish law, regardless of how you interpret it, I don't think anyone can interpret it to say that I'm justified in discriminating against somebody else. And so the premise at the onset is how have I as a congregational rabbi, and I'm certainly not the only person uh, in this leadership position. I'm, there's many other colleagues of mine who are also doing incredible work. And I think for a lot of us, especially in some of the younger generation rabbis, we've been enlightened by society around us. We've had the, the benefit of seeing the cultural changes happening within society as a whole, not just within the Jewish community, not just within the religious community. So whilst we might seem quite progressive and you know, might get some accolades that we've done such an amazing job, I think we're just fortunately the product of our times, which is a, which is a great time to be living in. That being said, as Leanne ended, um, I don't think we've hit the target and I think there's still so much more work to be accomplished. So I'd like to just address a number of um, aspects within, I guess, my congregational experience, what I've seen through my time as a rabbi, and it's relatively not a long time. It's been about, I've been about 15 or 16 years in varying roles. So I have seen quite a bit from my very beginning role, um, certainly in Australia before I was in different countries, but I remember coming to Australia uh, initially to be the rabbi on campus with my dear wife, Sarah. We were um, uh, rabbi and rabbits on campus. And I think already seeing the interaction with the, the young adults or the students at the time gave us a lot of insight really, as I mentioned, you know, to the changing and the shifting cultural values. And I know this is a gender equality, but just as an example, you know, when we talk about, um, uh, you know, this, this whole progressive community where we are becoming more enlightened and more respectful, having a lot more empathy to, to, to people, you know, when it comes to the LGBTQ community, I remember going back, this was in South Africa, I was, I was invited on a seminar to the equivalent of orgies, which is soldiers. I remember they were talking about those issues and I saw there was this uncomfortability and this was about, you know, 18 or 19 years ago. But when I came to Melbourne and we were on a birthright program with some of the students from campus, this topic, it, it didn't even fluster anyone. People were so respectful and so open that everyone has their own way. And I think luckily that's, I think the, 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 the level and the road that we're traveling in the gender equality space. But we have a lot of, and we've had a lot of challenges. Um, and I think the, the opening challenges have been, unfortunately, and as I said, I'm, I want to be respectful to all um, halachic opinions, but certainly, and you'd have to be, you know, hiding under a rock to believe that there wouldn't have been a perception, at least, of inequality within Judaism. You're going back over, the, over generations where men had certain different roles to women. And of course, a lot of those roles, I believe, based on the times, you know, based on the era, uh, were often were often abused in a way, you know, because men might have had a particular religious function and women had another function that would have been unfortunately extended to parameters which don't even exist in halakha. It was really just about, well, we as men feel that we are, you know, more important, have a better role, have a more important role. And sadly, as generations develop and as people become so accustomed to that, it becomes embedded in the society and in the culture. 
like you mentioned, Leanne. And so it really needs a massive cultural shift, a cultural change. And so I think one of the roles that I felt is that as the rabbi of my community and now at South Caulfield, previously in Doncaster, as a campus rabbi in previous shuls, is for the language coming from the religious leader needs to be one of expressing to the community, number one, equality, that we're all equal in God's eyes. There's not one of us who's more important because of our gender, because of our orientation, because of our beliefs. We're all God's creatures in a sense. And at the same time, I think it's a matter of putting it into practice. So it's all nice and well to write about it. And I've had the privilege of, you know, being asked to write some articles for the Jewish news. I have, you know, obviously we all have social platforms today. So anybody can really express an opinion. You don't have to necessarily only be able to write in, in, in a formal paper. You can have a Facebook page, you can have social media, YouTube channels. And I've used those tools to talk about this, to talk about the importance of recognizing the crucial need and recognizing that, that we weren't in a good place. You know, to be 100% honest, there was taking advantage of certain principles, certain practices. And I'll give you an example. And again, I hope I don't offend anybody that, that might watch this. Um, of course, those are who are here today. But I'll give you an example. You know, if, you know, if we talk about the Mechitza as an example, I know this is a contentious issue because there's all different opinions whether you know how do you have a mechitza should you have a mechitza that's the dividing line in a synagogue which separates between the, the male and the female side but when it comes to the social aspect i remember attending a synagogue it was in australia so don't start trying to work out who it is it's not you know i'm not trying to but i remember going to a synagogue which had the mechitza and the woman had a much smaller segment and perhaps that was based on uh, earlier times where less women may have come and again as a fault of a society but when we went into the social space, the men at their kiddish, you know, which is sort of the refreshments afterwards, had a, a table filled with, you know, beautiful cakes and, and an ample supply of food. When the woman had, they were just given a small little section with almost no food on it. And I looked at that and I said to myself, how can you say that this is in any stretch of the imagination acceptable? You know, I can, I can appreciate that there are those who would say when it comes to prayer, we should be separate. And again, we can discuss that all day. We can have a whole series on that in itself. But when we go to the kiddush and the, the, the treatment of what the men are getting versus what the women are getting, I think that was part of the societal problem within congregations. So it was a matter of expressing and talking to, at least where I have influence, to say that that was unacceptable. And I would never allow that to happen. So one of the first areas I think we, as a rabbi, you have to address is setting the, the bar of leadership. And for me personally, as an Orthodox rabbi, I think it's about letting the community see that my wife, Sarah, is not just somebody who does cooking shows, although she loves doing it. And, and it's, it's at her choice that she loves to, uh, and we, she does a lot of cooking demonstrations for the community, but she also gives shiurim, you know, Torah classes. She leads when it comes to, you know, creating the vision for the community. Um, we, we're pretty much a team. So it was about setting the agenda that in our school, in our community, it's not just the rabbi who's in charge. It's the rabbi and the rebbitzin, the female and the male, both equally important, both equally setting the agenda. Now, whilst I might have certain different roles in terms of the actual religious practices, it was very important and crucial for every congregation that I've led. And I think it's crucial for every rabbi. Now, again, some rebbitzins might not be as active, might not be as proactive, but I think the congregation needs to have that fee. If it can't be the rebbitzin for whatever reason, there needs to be some female representative as to that this is somebody who has that vision who has the leadership ability and as i said i've been fortunate that my wife can fulfill that role and many of the women will seek her guidance will seek her support will seek her halachic knowledge in so many areas so that was really i guess a very crucial aspect when it comes to i guess starting the starting point that when the congregation looks to leadership they don't just see one figure being the male figure they need to see leadership in terms of male and female setting the agenda now from a lay leadership point of view I think that's a lot easier and really there should be no excuses in that. Now, again, going back in time, unfortunately, there were, um, I think some of you look at some of the constitutions, perhaps even my, my congregation's old constitution, many of the synagogues that you might attend, some of them didn't allow females to be on the board, almost like society as a whole. And I think many have changed that since, thank God. I mean, we, I felt again, another massive challenge was getting leadership from the leadership from women. Problem was, women weren't motivated. They weren't interested, you know, and, and you could simply say, well, we asked them to be on the board and they said no. And that was almost like ticking a box, tokenism. Yes, we asked a few ladies to be on the board, but they, they refused. And instead of looking at yourself honestly and saying they refused because the culture hasn't changed and they don't really feel that they are being leaders. 
right? It's very nice to say, we'll have three women on the board, but they don't do anything. They don't say anything. And they never actually consulted. You, you, you're just, as I said, you're just being tokenism that you can answer a survey down the line that yes, we have women on the board. So you have to be really genuine with yourself if you're in that position, if you are setting the agenda to say that we genuinely want to appreciate and understand that having women on the board is not just because we need to tick a box or fit into some paradigm shift that's happened. You have to genuinely start to understand and realize, and I think I'm in the crowd that understands this more than anyone, that without the female voice, Without having women and that equality, the congregation is so much poorer. And I've seen it firsthand. I've seen boards and I've even been on boards at times where there's only been men involved. And I have to admit, it's, it's, you, you're missing a whole dynamic, a whole approach that is, is so beautifully strengthened by having that diversity. And I think, you know, when it comes to congregations, I've experienced, I've got a, I've got a new board now with some really powerful and forward thinking and brilliant women who are are literally changing the way that I'm seeing how we should take our congregation forward. And as I said, I would be much poorer and the congregation would be a lot poorer if we didn't have that experience. But again, I think the way that we were able to convince some of the women to come on board was because they saw that there was a genuine want to hear their voices. So number one, going back is at the top level, meaning Rabbi and Rebbitson, at the senior level of leadership, you need to have both voices being heard. Now, again, that might look different in different congregations, orthodox, liberal, uh, varying, you know, varying forms of orthodoxy and, and, and kolakavod and respect to all of those different ways. But you need to have, I think, at the most senior level, you need to have two voices that are representing both. And as I said, for me as a congregational rabbi, I, I feel like I'm achieving that. Thank God because of uh, my very dynamic wife who is incredibly talented and gifted and can lead uh, alongside me and the truth is she probably leads better than I do without her I probably wouldn't have done a lot of things that I've done I wouldn't have been able to achieve the things that I've done so that's crucial at the lay level leadership as I said the board level that's cultural you need a cultural change you need people in the community the people who have sat on boards for so long to really want to you know give over the leadership position to open to make that space uh, welcoming that the voices of women can be heard and I'll give you an example in particular I think, you know, if you're not even going to be prepared to go that far, which I think is, is crazy for congregations not, but when it comes to matters which, which affect the females of the community, you know, and, and you might think this, this is crazy, but, they, they, you know, over time, men were making decisions as to what's going to affect the females of any community. So to, to, to at least, when it comes to things that are going to impact females, to not have a female voice, I think, is criminal almost. And when you start to give women the ability to at least give their opinion, their voice, and to make decisions which, for matters which affect them, I think that will give them the confidence that the community is listening, that the community is serious about wanting to hear their voices. So I, I, I told the, um, the other day when we were speaking with the organizers, I, I just mentioned we, we had to change our machitza, the, the material, the, the shape, the thickness. And of course, the, the, the woman consulted myself and Sarah about you know, the halachic requirements from our um, understanding. But once we sort of had come to that uh, idea, it was the woman who had to make a decision, how they wanted it, how it should look. And interestingly, some of those women who did have that, uh, that ability to, to make such decisions have since taken up leadership roles in our community. So you see that from making those small changes, from giving them the ability that they believe their voice is not just there, as I said, as a tokenism, but really want to know what you want to improve the community, that's where it starts and that gets the ball rolling. And I think... I just see the upward trajectory of getting females in the most senior levels of our management. Um, you know, we've got a really good president right now, but we've been speaking about, you know, um, nurturing our next president and hopefully it can be uh, one of the women who are currently on the board who will learn about the congregation, who will learn about, um, you know, taking on the leadership role. And I think it would be such an incredible opportunity. The other very important factor when it comes to congregations is events. You know, shuls run many events. Shuls have guest speakers. Shuls have functions, seminars, webinars. And I think, again, another area of fault, another area of where there was needing growth. And I say fault not to necessarily point fingers, but really it was a fault of the community as a whole, was, again, male voices all the time. You know, you would, hear, you would see a Shavuot program. We're getting all the best speakers. And you looked at the list, and it was a list of men, 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 and that was it. Fortunately, and I think, and, and the, the National Council, I, I think you have a lot to, of credit in this space. And I think a lot of the other organizations that have been fighting for justice, 
can also give themselves accolades, um, where now there's a, there's a very conscious level, um, not again, and, and I hope it's not because people feel they have to tick a box. We want to get to a place where people say that if we don't have the, the, the alternate view, the other, the other side, you know, everybody being represented, men, women, and so on, then the event is just not worthwhile listening to. I hope society as a whole would not, you know, and I did say yesterday, you know, of course there are certain events where you might want to hear particularly a female voice. You might, you might want to hear particularly a male voice. That's understandable. But when you're talking about a general subject, I think if we don't want to have all those voices, and I certainly make a very conscious effort, again, because I want to, because I need to, because I think the congregation will be poorer without it when it comes to events. So we looked at the senior level, we looked at the board management, and again, we looked at the events, creating that culture where the society and the, our society, our small congregational society, and the influence that we have around are hearing. You know, So if you look at a number of the events, for example, that I've run over the last number of months, just as an example, you know, you'll see a, a nice array of female speakers, male speakers, all different, uh, you know, um, stories and, and, and backgrounds and so on. And I think that's really, really crucial. Um, starting the congregation, okay, so starting the congregation at, at a very primal level, I think, again, it's, it's building the culture from a young age. And I, and I know I've only got a few minutes more minutes to speak. So, um, and that is, you know, when it comes to our influence on the younger people of our community, um, I think there's a lot of perceptions that will change at the bar and bat mitzvah age, the 12 and 13 year old age. And that's another area of focus where we've put um, effort in to, to get bar mitzvah boys and bat mitzvah girls the ability and the, and the knowledge to know that their voices are respected in our community, their voices are heard in our community. And even though there might be specific roles in terms of their religious practices, we want them to feel that they have an equal voice in the community. And so our girls in our bat mitzvah program in particular, you know, when it comes to their leadership in the community from a very early age at that level, myself and Sarah and anyone else who's involved in our program, that's the message we're sending to them. We want you to be have to have an opinion. We want you to have a voice. We want you to set the agenda and lead our congregation forward. So there's a lot of different areas which we, we can get into. And of course, my time's about to finish. So I think as Leanne concluded, I'll conclude in the same way that um, we're on this journey together. It needs each and every one of us. There's nobody who can turn around and say, it's not my problem because all of us are, are, are in different group, different circles. And if you hear something, you know, if you hear a gender bias comment, um, and I know I'm about to run out, so I might say this in, in time for questions, but you know, I've at times called people out when they've said certain comments and it you might think, what's the difference? It's just one person, but it's that one person that affects absolutely real change. So Kolaka vote again to National Council for your incredible work and for putting this on and for all the other talks that you've hosted. And hopefully we can continue to grow together and to create a society that we will all be proud of and certainly one that God would be proud of. And I think that's the society that we're, that we're reaching and we're all having a, a, an involvement in doing so. Thank you. And um, obviously happy to take any questions as I'm sure Leanne is too. Thank you, Rabbi. That was very enlightening and interesting. And I know um, I certainly could keep talking and asking you questions in particular. Um, but we do not have enough time because we have lots of questions that are coming in. So if anyone wants to submit questions, please submit them through the chat function. And the survey that I mentioned earlier, there is a link in that uh, chat box. If anyone wants to participate, we would appreciate it. So now let's turn to the rabbi and Leanne. We have a few questions from our guests that are joining us today. This first question is for both of you. What resistance have you encountered in this area of your work and how did you overcome it? Um, would you like me to go first? Um, look, uh, I think I think I was fought off, I think I'm fortunate in the fact that I'm actually working in a community service organisation. So we have a strong foundation of social justice. Um, I feel like while we haven't had resistance, it's more trying to just make sure people are on the same page, which I mentioned. So we're all coming from a different background um, and just trying to um, navigate that with people as, as, as they bring, you know, challenges to the forefront. It, it seems, I think, within a community service organisation, you're starting from a great platform because people are understanding the inequity, you know, the injustice of inequity. Uh, I think in another organisation it could be um, a lot more challenging. Um, and I know 
when I was involved with the Workplace Equality Respect and Respect Project, there were two, two football clubs involved in La Trobe University. And I know they certainly encountered a lot of challenges um, because they also had, um, in terms of gender, the, the gender was quite different in terms of the balance. So we were predominantly a female workforce. So yeah, it probably didn't didn't encounter too many challenges. It's probably more around trying to just get everybody onto the same page and understanding those um, unconscious bias, as I talked about earlier. Thank you. Um, so I, I guess some of the challenges I faced um, in, in trying to achieve what I was doing is um, something I mentioned already, and I'll, I'll maybe go to one other point, and that is I think it, it's taken time. And again, when you change congregations, it's like starting all over again. But it takes time to, to actually have uh, the females of the community truly believe that that's exactly what you want. So, you know, you know in the, the first year in my congregation, yeah, it, it, not everybody took up the, the, the want to, for example, on the board to females wanting to come on the board. And again, I believe it's because they didn't feel that they necessarily were going to be heard. And they may, they may have felt that it was just a token question. So the challenge was to, and continues to be, to try and really convince people genuinely that this is what you care about. And how you do that is by what you say, by what you write about, what you talk about. And I think the more you express these views, people genuinely start to feel that this is exactly what this person wants. And I think the more people get to know you, hopefully, they start to see the real you. And so until that time develops, um, before people know that this is this is who you are as a person, then it, you might have setbacks. The other challenges, I guess, were perhaps some of the inbred, and again, I don't want to discriminate to older generation because there are many enlightened older members of the community um, who, who, are, who are against discrimination, who don't like inequality. But uh, by and large, some of the, 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 I guess, the kickback was from some members of this community when we tried to do some projects which I guess traditionally had never been done that way. And I'm not even talking about within halachic framework. You know, it's always been done in this regard. This, you know, men have always done this. And I think that was particularly difficult at certain times. But I think I'm in a fortunate position that, you know, because I'm the rabbi of the community in my, in, in my context, it was, you know, there is that level of respect that if the rabbi feels this is the right way forward, genuinely, or generally, sorry, people um, are happy to take that forward, you know. So, it's been a bit of a, a plus to have that backing, if you like, um, that if I, if I, you know, if the congregation respects you and, and feels that you, you're coming from a place of really wanting good to happen in the community, then they do, they do even though there might be some scuff, you know, some remarks under their breath at times, you know, but um, yeah, so still challenges ahead, that's for sure. So Rabbi, that actually is a good segue to a question that we have uh, received for you. How can you spread your message and your approach to other shuls? Okay, so that's an excellent question. Um, my method and my approach, I think, is shared by many of my colleagues. Um, uh, and in particular, at this point, there's the Rabbinical Council of Victoria. Um, I was president of that organization a few years ago. And I think the forward thinking of many of the rabbis on that uh, council is, is shared by so many of us. And it's, again, I think we're, it's a product of our society. So as I said, uh, rather than taking accolades and saying we're such fantastic rabbis and leaders, we are lucky that we live in a society that as a whole is moving in the right direction. Um, but, you know, I think we set the agenda at the Rabbinical Council. So, for example, the Rabbinical Council probably for generations never included the voice of Rebbitsons in, in, in its organization. And now the Rebbitsons are, you know, for example, we did over the holidays, the, the rabbis each had a day that we, we presented a short thought on the, on the, on the day, a religious thought. And after the rabbis had a go, then all the Rebbitsons had a go. So it was a two minute video of rabbi for, for two weeks and then two minute video each day of the Rebbitsons each day. And I think as, a, as an overarching body, when people see they say, hold on a minute, this the society is shifting, the religious community is shifting. And even if we might, as I said, even if we might not agree on halachic matters per se, that some people might feel, well, you should progress in the halachic realm too. I've seen and I've heard from, from feedback from members that they feel that this is really a positive step. And so sharing that message is, I guess, done at that um, overarching body, really. And just from conversations, I mean, I talk to some of my colleagues who are the rabbis at some of the more popular shuls, and we talk about these matters, you know, we discuss it, we debate it, we, we innovate together. And um, yeah, hopefully we set, we set the, the agenda and the, the way forward for maybe rabbis who are now taking over, perhaps rabbis who 
may want to learn from our approach. So the beauty of, of technology today, people can see what you're doing. You know, people can see what events you're hosting. And I think that spreads um, in its own way in, in a sense. Great, thank you. So Leanne, this question is for you. And then I, at the, after that, I'd actually like the rabbi to um, explain this from his perspective regarding his board. So Leanne, the question is, how do you give employees time allowances to pursue um, gender equality education? And then to the second part, Rabbi, if you can jump in afterwards, is are you doing that with your board and how so? So Leanne? Oh, look, if, um, we've got a strong, um, a strong kind of culture of trying to support people in terms of their professional development. Um, we, we certainly have a lot of informa a lot of um, training on our um, website that's, that um, employees have access to. But anything that actually um, would would be of value in terms of their professional development, and how they do their work, which is really um, gender equality is you know extremely important. Um, we would be supportive of that. Um, so just yeah, if they, if they come up with something that they would like to pursue, we'd certainly look at how that fits with the work and would be very encouraging. And I just think it's, it, you know, as I said, there's a whole range of ways to kind of bring that information back into the organisation as well. So if people go off and do some, a particular, you know, piece of training, particularly around gender equality, we'd be looking at how that could be shared amongst the teams and more broadly as well. So really trying to embed that culture of learning and, and um, reflection. Thank you. So uh, yeah, I would have to say that there's, a, I guess, a similar approach at our board. But before we even, um, I guess, canvassed and, and looked at um, nominations that came in, we wanted people who, within their own, um, I guess, professional backgrounds, were aligned with this forward thinking, you know, and uh, having people who would, you know, naturally, you know, from their training at work, from their, their positions in the community, are, um, you know, are, have no issue with you know, with gender inequality and all those types of or gender equality. And I think um, what we do at our board level, you know, of course, we look at varying community talks that occur in the community, such as this one. Unfortunately, the time of this one was, I know a lot of my community wanted to watch this, but the time was a bit difficult with um, the daytime, but I know a lot will want to watch it afterwards. But, you know, keeping abreast of what professional things, development things are occurring in the community. And in our board meetings, I mean, we do have under general business and we do have a, um, um, which are social justice matters, you know. So in particular, uh, unfortunately, and it's sad that our community ever got to such a point, but, you know, you know, every, we, every meeting we look at, you know, the safety of children, for example, you know. So these matters are raised at every board meeting and people have the ability to express their views if they feel there's, a, there's something that's, we've gone astray or we're not doing something correctly. So there is that space at each, at each monthly board meeting. And again, it, because I'm the, the, the spiritual leader of the community, um, I, I think the board likes to see that I'm heading in that direction, that, the, that the, the, the speeches that I'm giving don't ever come across in a way that perhaps is, um, is, is bringing us back down, you know, so they're almost a watchdog in some way, um, but I'm also, I guess, a spiritual guide for them too, if that answers the question, I hope it does. Yeah, thank you. Um, Leanne, you mentioned earlier the champions of change, the question that's come in, what are the expectations for a champion of change? Look, I think it's probably more of an informal role that they've played, um, but the expectation would be that, I mean, we have a number of people within our organisation, had within our organisation that are really um, clearly driving, you know, and are quite outspoken and, and comfortable with being outspoken and feel confident about their um, perspective on gender equality. So it would really be anybody that kind of can come to the fore in terms of having those conversations. So the champions are probably more around how they how they kind of live and breathe within the within our organisation. And it was something that we probably engendered, you know, particularly um, in connections to try and bring people along and, and we knew there were people that felt a lot more confident about the, the subject and particularly um, some of our um, staff that were in fam the delivery of family violence programs. So I think it's about just people, you know, kind of taking on, it was probably more of an informal um, nomination that they just took on, you know, as a, a bit of a champion to drive it and become involved and were very passionate and would 
you know, be always at, at the meetings and, and leading and leading the conversation. So they were kind of those natural leaders in the, in the subject. And we, you know, would all have those within certain aspects of our organisations. Um, yeah, so that, yeah, it's probably more of an informal role. Now it's it's probably morphed into, you know, people's understanding and, um, you know, having those, as I said, challenging conversations. If, if something, if someone observes something that just doesn't, doesn't seem quite right, actually being able to call it out and do it in a respectful way. Great, thank you. Man, another question that came in for you was, how did you convince the board to spend money on gender equality programs when you went to do the, the shift in culture? Right, okay. So um, we actually didn't, we had to kind of really work with our senior management. So this was in, in connections. It didn't actually take us, at that point in time, didn't take us money. It took us, it took us resources, basically. It took us people um, and it took time really and people. So we were in, we were, were able to manage that without actually taking it up to the board. Um, I think we were really fortunate when we morphed into uniting or we amalgamated at the commencement of July 2017 because we transitioned from um, connections into uniting and the CEO of uniting, Paul Lanossia, was the um, CEO of Our Watch prior to... <laughs> you know, a, a couple of years ago prior to becoming the CEO of um, Uniting. So we actually had, you know, while it, it wasn't kind of out there, I think we had someone that was really very, very um, invested in terms of um, equality and respect. And um, so I think that was kind of probably embedded in some of the practices and processes that are, are now continuing as well. So, um you know, I, I believe we, we had a champion at a, at a very senior level, really, our CEO. So, um, yes, and now we've moved in. We have a, a um, new CEO who's, who is also, um, I feel, we see that and live and breathe it, and we've seen that with paid parental leave and some of those other initiatives that, that um, have been embedded. So, um, yeah. Short, a longer answer to a short question, but um, yeah, so I think it's about the conversation and I think we're certainly in a different space to what we were four years ago, which is fabulous. Great, thank you. Rabbi, this question has come in for you. What percentage of women are on your board and how many are on the Rabbinical Council board? So the Rabbinical Council board, um, the, the way, because it's a rabbinical council, the, the, mem the official membership is, is the rabbi at this point, but all the, all the spouses, all the wives, the rabbitsons are part of it. So, for example, when we had the rabbi speaking, so you had, let's say, 30 rabbis who participated, you had 30 rabbitsons who participated in speaking. So it's, it's now at a point where I think to formalize it, I think that's where the next conversation is going to go in terms of formal membership um, for them. But... The Rebbitsons have their own sort of, um, I guess, informal gatherings and talks where they, you know, for example, we had a retreat this year where the rabbis went on a conference and the Rebbitsons are going, unfortunately, their conference got cancelled because of Corona and it's being rescheduled for next year. But to sort of have that equal footing that when, what the rabbis are doing and the rabbis are getting trained. So all our professional development, for example, you know, is now open to the Rebbitsons, which wasn't done, you know, in previous times. So, um yeah, so you're, seeing, you're almost seeing an equal footing, thank God, in terms of the development, the output, and, um, you know, the training for them. In terms of our shul board, I think we it's about 40% now are females on the board. Um, and again, as I said, it's, it's, I think it's going to take a bit longer for females to really want to. And I think that our current uh, board, the females on the board, are, I think are going to set a, set a precedent, which I'm hoping, because they're incredibly vocal, they're incredibly gifted, and they are leading, you know, and I think when the other members of the community see that, there'll be a lot more uptake, I think, um, that women will want to get in and have an ability to, to lead. And I think my wife, Sarah, has been um, leading that, that role as well, you know, really getting in the ear of the, of the woman and saying, look, it's not just a tokenism. You can really affect change. You can really bring your expertise, your area of knowledge, and really grow in your own right. I mean, obviously, you want to, you want to develop it yourself as, as a board member. So... Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's really going in the right direction. And again, I'm not. I think it's important. I'm not about necessarily having 50-50, You know, as a as a as a strong strict standard. Unless you know, that 
but I really want women to lead, you know, and so if that's going to require having 50 50, then that's what's going to be, you know, and, and so I think it's not necessarily just about ticking boxes that I can report to the National Council or anyone else asked that I can say, yeah, yes, I've got 50 50, you know, and the five women out of the 10 board members don't ever come or don't ever do anything or say anything. It's not, I don't think you, you've achieved anything. So you, you, even if you had one woman that's possibly the present, but it's really leading and is really bringing the female voice, I'd rather have that than have five silent, you know, people who are just there for the sake of it, you know? So you really, as I said, going back to what I said in the beginning, it really needs to be believable that they are making a change. And we had this issue, and I don't want to, you know, digress, but when it comes to young people being on the boards, I think a lot of congregations struggle with that because they put one youth person on the board and the youth person never made any decisions or never did anything, just sat there like a stone, you know? Um, and so the youth didn't want to come on the board because why, who wants to sit every day, every month for two hours to be a stone? Not very exciting, you know? Thank you. Yeah, so um, we are going to have to be wrapping up, but I have one more question um, for both of you. Often we hear in the community um, with different organizations, et cetera, that they would like women to be involved, but they have a hard time either finding a qualified expert speaker for their panel conversation for an event or finding um, qualified interested women in serving on a board. And like I said, we only have a few minutes, but would love to get your opinion if you think it would be helpful if there was a community database that provided candidates that could accomplish either one of those panels for events um, or serving on community organization boards. Do you want to start, Leanne? Yeah, look, I, th I think it'd be a fabulous initiative. Um, yeah, I was just thinking it would be really hard to know where to go to access um, and to understand what the opportunities are. So I think something like that as a resource would be fabulous. Um, yeah, look, I, I have to agree. I mean, it, it, it would never hurt to have such a resource. I just don't find, I've never struggled to find women in any area of expertise, to be honest. Um, <laughs> um, as I said, getting them on my own board has been a challenge because, um, as I said, it needed, it needed actual change to happen. Um, but there's, you know, there's plenty, like, again, just looking at the last few months, we've, we've had hosted many, many talks. I, it, it hasn't been that difficult, to be honest. <laughs> if I want to talk about medicine, you know, there's plenty female, you know, experts and male experts. But again, you would make my life easy as a program organizer if, if there was a database that might, you know, prevent me having to go to Google and start researching. Yes, by all means, I think it would be well received by any community event organizer. Well, thank you both for that feedback. I'm, I'm proud and pleased to let you know that that is a project that is uh, undergoing um, uh, work here in our organization. So more details on that to follow. It's just in uh, the uh, beginning stages, but very, very exciting. Um, I wanna thank both of you, Rabbi Rabin, um, Leanne Chapman, thank you so much for joining us today. I think your thoughts were very insightful and I think it's just the beginning of the conversation. And I look forward to more of those um, in the coming weeks and months. Wanted to let all of our guests know that there will be a follow-up survey sent to all of you and would really appreciate you taking a few moments um, of your time to let us know what your thoughts were um, for this webinar and how we can uh, improve for the next time. Also wanna let everyone know that we are still continuing our Make Space for Her campaign. This is a really important initiative of National Council of Jewish Women Australia here in Victoria. And we're really asking you to sign up to take the pledge. We already, as you can see on your screen, have 33 organizations that have signed up for the Gender Equality Make Space for Her campaign, and we hope you will join us um, in that initiative. Our next webinar on this subject is to be confirmed, but stay tuned on our social media channels as well as our website. For those of you who are wondering, today's uh, program will has been recorded, and the slides with the program will be available on our YouTube channel. And if you don't already follow us on all of our social media, I hope to see you there and we can continue this conversation. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And don't forget also to participate in the survey link that we are doing with Monash in partnership with the ACJC, the Monash University's Australian Center for Jewish Civilization. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Stay well. <laughs>